What's up, everybody? I'm John Mello. This is the Road to a Thousand Users. Uh, we are taking a look at the different strategies that people have to find their first user base and audience. Uh, I think a lot of people think that the hard part of building an app is the build part. In my opinion, it's really the finding users and getting their attention is really the most challenging thing. And there's no clear way to do that because every audience is different. So I, as I've said before in like the past videos, I'm building an app centered around solving problems for freelancers and agencies that use Bubble. So I'm also talking about a lot of content in that area. And I'm lucky enough today to be talking with Jonathan Timianko. Did Timianko. I say it right? Got Timianko. It. Yeah, Timianko, yeah. Uh, and who, ha who actually has found a user base, is solving a problem for boat doc sharing, which is a very interesting problem that I, I've never heard anyone even talk about, uh, but it is a problem. And I think, Jonathan, if I'm not mistaken, you've processed over a million in transactions on your platform today. Is that right? Sick. Yes. They, yep. Not a lot of us can say that. So that's, that's, that's awesome. So like I mentioned before, I think what I want to kind of just extract from you today, from your brain, is just your general philosophy on like the build part and how to attract your first set of users and just like like should go the mindset that people should go in with when they're trying to like build an app and get users yeah so uh hi everyone nice to i can't see you but you can see me obviously yeah. nice to, to meet everyone um so my name is john said my name is john tomianko i started a company called PeerShare, which is like airbnb but for docks for boats my parents bought a house on the water with a dock space for a boat and we didn't have a boat. And one day our cousin's friend needed the dock and I saw that happen and I saw that person pay my family for using our private dock behind our house, which I didn't think ever happened. I thought obviously boats stay in marinas. You know, I, I'm from the Northeast, I'm from New Jersey. So I, other than just going on a boat a few times I never really had any experience with boating. I didn't know about the market. I just was like, oh, this is really interesting. A person is using our private dock behind our house and they're paying my family to use it. There must be some type of market that exists or could be, I don't know it's possible. It may have just been a one-off, but that was what started the company and actually started the idea um, six years ago now. And, you know, obviously going from that to a million in transactions, 3,300 users or 3,500, uh, 3,500, we just crossed 3,500 nice. there. That is a long and windy road that is fraught with numerous challenges and I cannot simplify it. It's difficult, but here's the way to think about the problem in general. This was kind of my trajectory. So I started off with the idea. I saw the boat dock. I thought to myself, okay, if this boat is coming to our house, maybe there could be others going to other houses. So what's the best way to test that? So I did a search online and I found out, I didn't even know this, and not too many cited was the fact that other than Craigslist, this specific niche actually existed, but yeah. on a very small scale. And there was someone who set up a website for people to list dock spaces behind their houses. It may have been old, it may have been bad, but it at least said to me, okay, there, if people are paying money to post their doc on this site and you're seeing them keep it on for like a year, it must mean that voters are messaging those people or getting in touch with them that would cause them to do that, which means there is some type of market. I didn't, I knew it was more than what the initial doc transaction at my house was. I didn't really know the size but I knew that there was at least a small community. Discovered this problem because it really wasn't like a discovery kind of by chance too. It was just, yeah, you know, like exactly. you, yeah. you could have easily just ignored that whole thing of like, you know, the, the, the person coming to your parents' house and just been like, you know, not notice that that's an opportunity, right? So did you know about bubble and no code? And like, did you even have a concept of building this on your own at that point? Or is it just like, oh, this is a cool business idea that-, yes, that I didn't know this was back in like early 2016 bubble was not the size and it didn't have no code was not a term back then the um bubble was i think they had just they were like in beta for three years but they had just started getting a little bit bigger but i think i was one of the first like 
25,000 or 50,000 users, obviously now they have 2 million. But I didn't know, I did not know at that point that I saw that boat at that dock. I had absolutely no idea how I was gonna build it. I actually spent three months finding a way to build it. I started on WordPress based on the recommendation of a friend um, who is like my best friend from California. He started his own thing. He didn't know about Bubble, Bubble was early. Um, so he pointed me in that direction. Uh, I started, but I didn't get too far. And what happened was around three months in, I, I could have very easily given up in that three month period. And then I wouldn't have a way to build it. If I, if I did not find Bubble, like I was persistent. I said to myself, this seems like a legitimate opportunity that has some demand. I want to leave my corporate job and I want to chase something. This seems, I like technology and transportation. I love those topics. So I thought to myself, it's worth, it really is worth like chasing this. I need to find a way to build this somehow. Like I have to find a way. I, I was contemplating learning how to code, but I said to myself, there has to be like a way. And then I found Bubble and once I got on, obviously here I am. Now, why, why did you have, and you could, because I think what 90% of the people do when they have a technical uh, a solution to a problem or when they're thinking about building a technical solution to a problem that they see, the first thought, and myself included in this, is to go to Upwork and hire a freelancer or developer to build it for you. Why did you not go that path? I, I knew going into it that if I didn't have control over my experience, over the way I wanted to build it, at least in the beginning, just to get, obviously I'm not thinking about like huge scale like at the beginning, but I thought to myself, if I, if I can at least get to some form of revenue on my own with no outside help, I deserve nobody else's money. No one else. Interesting. No one else. Very interesting. And that's a great, I think that's an amazing DIY philosophy and, and I and now, but I had to I had to get there, right? I have that now, and I refuse to rely on any other, you know, person to build out an app that is my idea. I should control the direction of this and not have to rely on a team of developers and have no technical understanding of the way the app works. But I had to get there, so it's interesting that you had that perspective right out of the gate, uh, you know, from like you know not being a non-technical person and and then you're but you're already like i don't want to rely on anybody so i'm gonna to have to find a way to do this on my own the the beauty so remember we were talking about 2016 we're now in 2022 yeah. the, beauty, the beauty of today and the benefit of those who are watching the stream right now is that they don't have to guess if they can actually do it on their own i had to guess if i could do it on my own because i didn't know about bubble in the beginning but now since everyone watching has the no code infrastructure the industry there's a whole industry around it there's all these tools they don't have to guess whether they can build it or not they just have to go in and learn how to actually build it and then they can build it so they're already like they're 10 steps ahead of where i was in 2016 and if i was starting today i probably would have shaved off like six months in the beginning already Same. with yeah. the boot camps that we teach with bubble plus just knowing about this whole concept and how tech is changing from, okay, you don't have to outsource it. You can build it yourself instead, you know? So it's, it's, the timing is interesting. Like I, I was early, um, but um, yeah, if you guys, I mean, for those of you who are watching um, the bubble platform, no code, external services, whatever you want to do, you can, you really can build the entire thing on your own, but here's the thing. And this is what I would say to that. Just like I spent a lot of time in the beginning hustling for years, trying to get to where I need to be, you have the toolkit to do it, but the tool doesn't build your business. You have to build it for yourself. So you have to apply yourself and still do all the difficult things you need to do, but at least you can do it now. You don't have to guess whether you can do it yourself. There's a clearer path, I would say now. Absolutely. Uh, and, and there's also a shit ton more resources now, like boot camps, like, uh, you know, all of the content that's on YouTube, whereas, you know, I think back in 2016, 2017, we were really just kind of piecing together uh, uh, how to work on Bubble. Can Bubble do what we needed to do? Like, that was the big question, right? Can Bubble do this? Now, it's pretty clear that you could pretty much do anything on Bubble, especially if you know 
how to, uh, like, if you know a little bit of custom code, like JavaScript, you can build plugins to extend the platform to do whatever the hell you want to with it. Um, but that, I think that was a big question in the beginning when I first started, it's like, is this real? Like, can I really build this idea with, you know, and I think to some extent people still have that, that question, um, which, which kind of leads me into that, you know, that second area that I want to discuss with you is like the, the current marketing of not just bubble, but just no code in general, I think is very centered around cheap, fast, easy which I think sets some very bad expectations for some, for both founders that are trying to get into learning bubble, like right? non-technical people like us who, who want to learn the platform and also just like agencies and freelancers there. It sets the expectation for their, for their clients that, yeah, I'm going to have like Amazon in two weeks. Right. And it's going to be like $2,000 to build. Right? Right, right. No, no, it doesn't right. work that way. Right. This, this learn this this whole thing like the, the, I think you pointed out something important the tool that you have is just the tool right that's just one aspect of building a business and app development right that's that's one part of it yes that part is easier than traditional hand coding but there's so much learning that you have to do as you go through this process no one's going to do that for you it's effort it's a lot of effort it's years so um what do you think is like what would you say is like the big challenge around the, the, the no codes marketing today? And like, what would you, what would you do differently? if like you were in the driver's seat of that, of, of how they market themselves and message. Themselves. Yeah. So the first thing I would say is bubble got to 2 million users. So I can't say, you know, it'd be disingenuous to say they're not doing something uh, right. Obviously. Right. So I, I think, I think the challenge right now is bubble got its 2 million users. They're doing well, they raised a hundred million, people are building. I think, like you said, the what it's really about now is kind of resetting expectations to a certain extent. I so the first thing I would say is on the term no code. I think the term no code is actually a little bit disingenuous. I think that it's I think it's a good term to get people hooked in. But I don't think it's something that keeps them there. You know what I mean? And I think, yes, we are not coding the traditional way with the existing integrated development environments, syntax, all that crazy stuff. We're not dealing with it. But we are having to deal with, OK, how are you going to build out all your databases? What's the user experience going to be on your application? What's the application going to look like when a user's doing this, when they're doing this, 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 you know, we're, we have to, when you're building that, those concepts and, and um, figuring out what you want your app to look like and function, that's never going away. What's different is that the actual process of constructing it is more efficient and faster, but all the things that happen in regular code with, you know, reusing parts unnecessarily and making individual mistakes. Like that is all present in Bubble. I can't speak for the other no-code platforms because I'm all in on Bubble, but I, you know, those concepts, they do happen in Bubble, in the Bubble environment, which means that if they actually happen in Bubble and engineers doing traditional coding happens, then the, it's, it's kind of weird to say it and kind of hypocritical, but the process of a regular developer coding and using no code are fundamentally not that much different. It's just there's less syntax that you have to deal with. They automate more processes. So as it relates to, you know, no code and marketing, you know, if I were in the driver's seat for Bubble, what I would say is you have all the power. This is what I literally say to a person. You have all the power a regular developer does, or, or, or sorry, you have all the power an entire team of people have doing regular coding, and you can do all that stuff, Those what those five people are doing. You have this supercharged platform that replaces the need for those five people doing it, and you can do all the stuff those five people did. If you want to do what those five people did, it's probably going to take you just as long, frankly, if you want to build something like Amazon or Airbnb, it's going to take, actually Airbnb has way more, they have more than five people, they have a thousand engineers. You can do what those 
500,000 engineers are doing an Airbnb. You can actually do it yourself, but it's going to take you a really long time. But the thing is, you don't have to do it all yourself. Instead of having 500 people, have five to 10, and then don't spend that amount of money. You know, don't, you don't have to raise tons of money. You don't have to go into huge amounts of debt to build your product, but just realize just the Airbnb team of 500 to a thousand people, all the challenges they had, you're going to have, right. but you just have a better tool that does it faster and more efficiently, but you still have to build everything. You can't get away from those fundamentals is yeah. really what it comes down to. There's no way you have to understand how development works at a fundamental level. You're never going to get away from that. Right. And, and, you know, also people talk a lot about templates and stuff. And for people who are design challenged and graphically and artistically deficient, like myself, templates are a fantastic way to get your design like up so that you don't have to worry about your artistic ability, but templates, they are not a shortcut for functionality. So, you know, someone may have built like a, uh, accounting system for whatever but can you take a generic accounting template and then apply it to what you're doing you're probably gonna have to tear up the template change it and then you're back to square one so i would encourage people who are starting on this journey don't use templates learn it from scratch build it from scratch learn all the development skills you need through bubble bubble will allow you to build your product and learn development at the same time regarding this conversation, I think you always have to keep in mind also what type of app you're talking about. If you want to use Bubble to put up like a simple travel blog and just that call it a day, then that's wonderful. But if you want to build a very, very advanced data-driven dynamic app, all the stuff that's going to happen in regular coding is going to happen here. And a person who's building that type of application, you cannot think to yourself as you're building it, oh, I thought the Bubble platform was supposed to give me Amazon in half the time. So, <laughs> you know, so I don't know, man, I don't know. Bubble is, you can't be in that mindset. It's just, yeah, gonna, yeah it's just, you, you, you now can do it instead of having to rely on five people, but you still have to do it. Right. No yeah. code does not mean no effort. Right. Exactly. You got it. The, um, you touched on something else that I want to, I want to explore a little bit, the timeline. Right. So I think there is a very big focus when someone starts down, you know, the, the path of building an app. Uh, they expect things to happen very fast. Like, oh, I want to have this launched by the end of the quarter. I want to have 100 yeah. users by in six months. Right. And they set these arbitrary timelines for themselves. And then when they don't meet them, they look at that like a failure. And it's like, oh, this is just not, you know, this isn't a real idea. Um, where, whereas I look at this, like, there's no way to put a timeline around your learning someone else's problem, right? It just comes when it's going to happen. So if you're really interested in solving a problem for somebody as you're doing with, uh, with peer share, you, you, if you can't put a timeline on that, it just has to happen like naturally when it's supposed to happen. So how do you think about that? Well, I want to go back to my my first year, right? When I started the company, what happened was I was on vacation from my accounting job. And my first year of the company was literally learning bubble. I literally spent, this was before we had all the resources and all the wonderful, it, you know, I obviously me finding bubble, learning it is part of the process, but I spent, I spent the first nine to 12 months of my company. It wasn't even building the product. It was knowing that I was going to build on bubble and then actually like building on bubble on my nights and weekends so that I knew that I could actually create it on my own. I spent, so my first nine to 12 months of the company wasn't getting customers. It was like, is that, am I going to actually be able to do this? I obviously kept my, my day job while I was doing that to, to hedge against the possibility that I would not be able to at least get something up. But I spent, I really spent nine to 12 months in the beginning. And I know that sounds like a long time, but in business and apps and everything, that's like, that's a joke. Like that's just, that's nothing. I mean, if you aren't willing to spend nine months to figure out if you can build something, don't build it. Yeah. 
like just don't it's because it's if you if you don't have the patience to like you and you know actually emmanuel the the founder of bubble he said something really good on a youtube that i was watching he said um if you're not willing to spend 10 years of your life getting your business to where you need it to be just don't do it yeah. i mean it's, gonna, it's anything you do it's going to take you 10 years i'm six years in you know maybe not full time i'm four years in full time um you know before that was just um you know obviously learning nights and weekends working my regular job but like you have to be long-term focused and i think with bubble since bubble you have to have a long-term view like plain and simple like mm -hmm. it's gonna take you a while to build it and you need to put in the time only do it if you actually if and people have said this even before no code if you're not passionate and dedicated to a problem don't try to solve it and th that becomes even more well, what i think bubble does very well is it forces people into that mindset because now you don't have to go to venture capital firms or hire entire teams of engineers to build your product but you have to build them so that gives you a lot of power but also a lot of responsibility and you have to ask yourself okay is this something that i want to pursue i have the tools to do it now i don't have to use an excuse like oh you know i'll get to someone else's money and then they'll figure out for me if i want to do it so it, it's a lot of the stuff is changing where it's forcing people into the right mindset and i think that's one of the most powerful parts of um the no code movement it's it is the tool but i think it's the way it's changing the way these companies start and it makes them more sustainable for the long run yeah uh, i think it's the, the difference of building a business versus building a startup you're building yeah. a business right forget about like the, the way that we've thought about startups in the past i mean it's still happening you know what i mean like there's still vcs out there there's still but i I see that model slowly going away as these tools gain more prominence and it's more and people are going to adopt a more DIY do it yourself mentality around building apps, building businesses. And it's not like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to spend I'm going to get a, a million users before I make any money. No, you got to figure out how to make money straight away. Right. You're not going to make it if you're not making money. Right. So I, I and I definitely. Uh, I subscribe to that mentality, you know, like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll point you out to something that is happening right now that I'm fixing right now on my application. I'm finding out that, so we have a bunch of doc listings on our platform. People browse them, obviously. And we found out that our user onboarding process was kind of asking the wrong questions in the wrong order. So what happened was in the last like month or so, we've had about 300 people that have said, okay, I want to dock my boat at this location. And what happened was out of those 300, only about 10% were completing that sign-up process. So, you know, what would happen in traditional venture capital or other types of situations would be, oh, don't worry about that. Don't, don't worry about the 10% conversion. Just, just get more people. Just get more people and, and that'll solve itself. And I say to myself, no, I'm taking that 10% and I'm going to fix it now. And I'm going to get that 10% up to 50, 60, 70. And we're going to funnel those users into the application and get them in now. We're going to solve this problem now. We're not going to wait until we have tons of people. And then it's a bigger problem. Solve it now. So what no code allows you to do is you solve those problems that are actual problems right now instead of later. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Um... And it's really understanding the why, right? Like it's not just, oh, when there's more volume of people, we will have a higher completion rate. It's, well, why the hell did these people stop? Like, what did I do? Like I did something wrong because if it was right and I was asking the right questions, they would have completed that shit, right? It's not, it, you, you put the responsibility back on you as the, as the builder to understand the problem a little bit deeper right you're just kind of chipping away a little bit every time you make some kind of discovery like that right and what you want to do is in order to have a really big application with tons of users eventually you need to solve these fundamental problems on the smallest scale possible now yes. before they multiply and get worse so what happens is most startups what they do is they ignore these 
fundamental, terrible problems in the beginning because they don't want to solve them because other people are giving them money to blow up and get big users and hopefully they'll cash out on their investment. But then the whole house comes crumbling down. And I mean, it was like, if I was in, if I took an alternative approach and I took money, I, I would hope that I would have this mindset. And, you know, I would hope that it would be the same whether I was using Bubble or other tools. But I think the difference is, and what Bubble does, or just no code does, is it allows individuals to think like me and you. It gives us a chance to actually build the companies the right way without, you know, without, it, it gives people like us who are more grounded in reality. Yeah. The, um, the opportunity to actually have something big in you know because there's a huge gap like if these tools didn't exist i don't think most venture capital i got rejected from y combinator twice i don't think vcs would fund my idea because they would say oh i don't know how many docs are there you know yeah. but i know there's a ton and i know this can be huge um so i'm giving i'm being given a shot you know yeah and then you're never at you're also like in that same mindset the, the buzzwords that startups seem to be obsessed with around like you know what's your runway what's your exit strategy those things go away i don't have an exit strategy i don't have runway i can do this for as long as i want to right yeah. as long as i'm interested in the problem you're living the life you want solving the problem you want you don't have to answer to anybody they don't, no one's telling you the way to solve the problem that you know how to solve. You're solving it yourself. Right. In the same boat, I, no pun to me. <laughs> <laughs> <Too sure. laughs> and, you know, if I, if I had raised money, if I had other people tell me how to solve this, it would have crashed and burned. Like I know, I know what my platform needs to be. I know even sitting here five years in, four years in, I know there's another five years of work. Well, there's always work. It's never going to end when you're building a tech. It's not like, okay, like you do it five years and then, oh, it's built and that's it. It's, it. There's always something new. But I know that if I have to sit here for another five years and just grind it out and I know that I can do it, or I know I can do it through bubbles, it's just going to take a while, but I can actually, as crazy as it sounds, me, myself, building it over 10 years will be more efficient than a team of 20 people building it inefficiently with other people's money over the same period of time. I like, why this? Like, what made you, of all the business ideas that you've probably had over the course of your life, you said your parents were entrepreneurs, you probably thought about starting a business before. Why was this the thing that stuck? You know, that's a great question. So um, first off, I, I would just want to get out of my job. That was the first thing that was, you know, I saw an opportunity. I always liked technology transportation right the mixture of those two things so i was like okay opportunities here seems like it's in the field that i'm interested in obviously it's not like an immediate like okay i'm really passionate about this it's like all right let's see what happens you know to answer your question i think i think what has kept me doing this up to this point is and this is this is kind of related to um the problem we're trying to solve now specifically at this point in the business you wouldn't know this obviously from looking at the site the site's going to be redesigned soon but the actual problem that i'm solving is now actually a little bit different than what the company started off as. so the company the spirit of the company starting off was airbnb for dock spaces a lot of people use airbnb to travel to other people's houses and people are renting each other's rooms. A lot of people have dock spaces behind their house. Then can we do the same thing and open up all these dock spaces around the world, just like Airbnb opened up a lot of apartments. So that's what the spirit of the company was, but what has kept me going up to this point and really a more interesting aspect of what we're going to try and solve over the next couple of years. And it's already rolled out a new version of our mobile app and it's in the process, but what we're, what we're really solving for now is, the mechanics of boats going from one dock space to another in an, in an, in a very efficient and frictionless way. So what this really is about now is it's not so much about like op it is about obviously opening up the dock spaces, but what it's really about now is creating a global network of dock spaces where 
if you hop from dock to dock on the system, right, you have the same payment processes and procedures and technological efficiencies and mechanics that you would um, that you get through the application that you otherwise would not get by not having that technology available. So right. in voting today, what traditionally happens is you go to one doc, you stay there, they have their own set of payment procedures, policies. And as you go from doc to doc, th those payments and procedures, they change. And there's actually a lot of, if you're going from one doc space to another, there's actually a lot of friction involved in ending a dock rental at one space and then going to another. So that actually causes a lot of issues and stress and communication issues and all that stuff is, is a problem for this market. And it's, it's actually, I actually think that aspect of the problem is a bigger issue than just opening up the extra dock spaces. That I'm sorry. So what this really is, is I'm, I'm basically going back to technology transportation, right? That was my interest. Uber has a global network of cars. They have a transportation network for the road. I believe that this can be a transportation network for the water. No one's done it yet. Nobody has solved this. I have the whole market ahead of me. I have the tools I need to build it. I know what needs to be done. I got my whole roadmap out. I'm just going to do it. I love that. Now, why? What, I, how long did it take you to figure out like the initial problem that you set out to solve is it's it's related but it's just slightly different than what you had you originally envisioned it how long did that take yeah so honestly i didn't really realize this aspect of it until probably past the first thousand years so this wow. this did not come up so when i was renting individual spaces right so a boat goes to a dock it's there boat goes to a dock it's there only until I started seeing boats move between them did I notice that there were these issues. And obviously, long story short, you go into a problem and you think that's the problem. But then as people start using it, you're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. But I wouldn't have known about this aspect of the business if I did not get past the first thousand users. So what that means is, if someone tried to replicate my idea from like Amazon, where, or if someone wanted to like get a bunch of coders and solve this, they would fail, like d horribly. They would crash and fail. And I, I hope that history judges me well on that statement, but uh, they would, it would crash and burn because only if you, the only way you know about the problem is if you are just in the deepest trenches of hell with your customers, I say that in a good way, because they're teaching you, right? Your customers are teaching you about what they want, about all the inefficiencies you're learning from them. And it, it just takes time. But if you, if you have all of the feedback spread amongst a team of people and it's not centralized on one person, then you're gonna lose the, the value of that feedback. Yeah. And that's- the um, most yeah. I think that's the 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 most important thing is to yeah to to have to to be in that feedback loop and be the the one commanding like okay this is how I'm going to interpret this feedback right and put that into an actionable plan, um and I think that also relates back to, you know what we talked about before around the timeline the arbitrary timelines that people set for themselves, how the hell would you have set a timeline? Think about if like somebody came to you and said I want to do Airbnb for doc shares. How much and how long you know what i mean like what you know how deep that problem goes you know how much learning you have to do to know before you get to this user set or what your feature set is even like your users are going to define your feature set not the other way around like you don't build first and then i mean that's the way that most people do it is like they build every feature that they can possibly think of put it out there and then hope for the best but in your in your demonstration right like you put something that you initially thought was out there and then just have changed over and over iteratively as your users give you feedback that i think even in customer discovery like had you been talking to these people at first would they have even known what their own problem was they don't, they they don't you're right the people who are doing this they don't even know what their own problem is exactly I, i'm getting it from them and i'm collecting that feedback and i'm making a solution for it but you know, i have a very deep and complicated problem 
that I'm trying to solve that is very difficult to solve at scale. And I think that raising money or accelerating early would, that would just, I wouldn't want to do that until I really, really figured out what the situation, what, what all my problems were and how to come up with a scalable solution to solve it. And I'm, I'm getting there. Like it's not fully there yet, but I'm like, I'd say two thirds of the way. Companies like Uber and Airbnb, like they are complicated in terms of technology, but in terms of the business itself, Uber is not a complicated business transaction. Press a button on your phone, the car comes, and it's it's simple. It's not really a difficult transaction. I have a very complicated transaction that has a lot of moving parts, a lot of logistics. It it takes time to figure out. So, you know. I think I don't want to disparage venture capital investing or anything like that, but um, I think that if you know upfront you have a very deep and complicated problem that's going to require a long time to figure out, use Bubble to just keep moving forward like I have, and and use the tool to figure out what the problem is so that you can build the eventual solution. Yeah, I agreed. All right, man. I think we're going to wrap it here. Uh, again, yeah. appreciate the insights. We, you and I have had these conversations one-on-one -on -one quite yeah. a few times, and I really wanted to get it out there because I think it's super valuable. And I think it's very counterintuitive to the way that people are thinking about app development today. Um, but th I, I see this as, as the way that app development is going to happen in the future. And, and this has been documented in, the, in like the Lean Startup, uh, the Mom Test, uh, the, the, the Minimalist Entrepreneur. These books like have all documented this. But I don't think anyone's done a good job of documenting as it's happening, right? Like everyone, the, the stories are always retrospect. You know what I mean? Like Absolutely. how did we get there? Yeah. So super valuable. If you are watching this on YouTube, try and join the Twitch stream every Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, we're going to be talking about more things around finding your first thousand users, more conversations like this with Jonathan. Uh, I will catch you next week. Thank you, right, guys. Buddy. Great meeting you.